We've been reporting today on the death of Russian President Boris Yeltsin. We continue our coverage with a special interview. World-renowned author Tom Clancy joins us now in our studio. And Mr. Clancy is a recognized expert on foreign affairs, particularly those of the former Soviet Union. Tom, thanks for being with us today. Pleasure, ma'am. First, let's start off with how important was Boris Yeltsin to Russia? Oh, God. You know, Boris really was the savior of his country uh, back in uh, 1991 when he got on top of the armored personnel carrier. Uh, he prevented uh, the reestablishment of communist rule over his country and literally you know, brought his country from communism into, into democracy. Uh, figures like him appear every couple of centuries, you know, with George Washington, Simon Bolivar, and you know, a handful of others. When we were growing up, a lot of people in our generations, when we were growing up, Russia was always the, the enemy. The Soviet Union was always the enemy. How should Westerners fear now what has happened? Or should we? Well, certainly it's a matter of great concern. Uh, the death of Yeltsin uh, before democracy has really taken root in, 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 in Russia, uh, before they've established a, a, a precedent for the orderly transition of power, it's a cause for great concern. What do you see happening now in the government? Uh, you're going to have a faction fight, uh, at least six, maybe eight different factions uh, trying to establish control over the country. Uh, some of them are good guys, some of them are bad guys, some of them are in between. Uh, it's going to be an interesting three months. What about the military? What happens with the military right now? Uh, Deborah, that's a great question. Uh, you see, the, the, historically the Russian military never had much military power. That was a mistake we always made with the Soviet Union, was assuming that their, their, their military had political influence. In fact, it did not. Uh, that's changed. You've got a very angry military now because it's been downsized, it's lost, lost prestige, and, and, and prestige and strength. And uh, in the simplest terms, they haven't been paid. So um, that's an interesting possibility. That brings up the next question then, what about the stockpile of nuclear weapons in the hands of these people that are angry? <sighs> There's a lot of things to worry about right now, Deborah, uh, and that's one of them. Uh, the good news is the safety locks on, on Russian nuclear weapons are essentially U.S.-made PAL systems. We, uh, we gave the Russians what we call the, the PAL, permissible action links. We gave them to the Russians back in the 1970s, so the weapons are physically safe. Uh, they're going to be set off by the person who has the oper operational codes, but the operational codes are going to convey to the new political leader, and uh, that's the problem. Do we have to worry now about the new political leader as far as the democratic elections? Will they hold? You ask me in three months. We really don't know. As I said, there's no precedent in Russia for the orderly transition of power, at least not since the demise of the, of, of, of the House of Romanov. So um, we just have to see what happens and, and really hope for the best. Do you have any predictions on who the next leader will be? I'd be very pleased if they just continue the way they're going. Uh, but you have a, a population, the, el the, the, the elderly people in Russia uh, would like the return of communism because of the certainty that, uh, under which they grew up. Uh, you have corrupt elements who, who, who will want power so they can run the Soviet Union like a big mafia family. Uh, the military will want to address legitimate concerns about national security. Uh, the church is looking to regain its influence. Certainly America can live with that. There are additional factions as well. There are people who are going to try to break the country up. The, the, some of the republics would like to break away. Uh, it's going to be an interesting three months, as I said. What kind of influence do you think other countries will have on the elections? Influencing a democratic elections in another country is a very dicey exercise at best. If we, we don't like it when people try to do it to us, and no other country is going to like it if we try to do it to them. Uh, we can try to exert the best influence for, you know, for, for, for the continuation of democracy. For, uh, you know, for things to, to, to continue to develop as they have indeed been developing. But direct interference with the, uh, with, with the elections, no, that's something we should not do. You talked about the way the older people in Russia want communism back. But what about the younger generation in Russia? What do you think they want? I think fundamentally they want the same thing everybody else in the world wants, a nice house, a couple of cars, and vacation every year, you know, better future for their kids. Uh, it, under, under Boris Yeltsin, they, you know, they've, they've tried to develop the Russian economy, denationalizing industries, uh, uh, you know, doing all the things to, to, to jumpstart a, 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 a socialist communist economy into a free market economy. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, and it frankly has not worked very well at this point. That's, but, but really, that's the only hope they have, because I fear if, if for example, the reestablishment of communist rule would lead to another civil war. So is it up to the younger generation, then, to pull forward right now? Um, it usually is. 
Thank you very much for joining us. And of course, we'll have more information as it becomes available. This has been a WRAL special report.